On a distant planet called Chikyu, there are five kingdoms living together in peace under the guardian spirit King Oger, but monsters called Bugnarok threaten that peace. Luckily, the kings are able to transform and defend their nations. However, there may be more than what appears on the surface. Or so the story goes. Welcome to the story of Tokusatsu, where I give you a straight recap and review of a show, just passion to tell a story, and going beyond that in the second half of this video. Full spoilers ahead. We start on planet Chikyu, where ceremony begins for its five kings to sign a treaty to unite their kingdoms under one alliance to fight against the Bugnarok, of which arrive during the ceremony to enact war. The Bugnarok are led by their king, Deathnarok VIII, and his retainer, Kamijin. Our heroes transform to defend their people. <laughs> Meanwhile, an orphan from the Shugadam kingdom named Gira enters the castle to confront the king of Shugadam, Rakulis Hasti. Gira questions why his king is not protecting the people, to which Rakulis says that sacrifices are inevitable, and that he's using this war to take over the other kingdoms that don't side with him. Gita doesn't take his words lightly, and takes the king's sword, the Odra Caliber, to become a tyrant king himself. Gita is able to awaken King Oger, the planet's guardian spirit, in the form of a giant mech, something that shouldn't have been possible for a commoner. No! With that, the following episodes have the royalty take Gita and investigate who he is, along with introducing us to their kingdoms. First we have Tombo Oger. President Jan Magast of Inkosopa, a nation of vast technology where arguments are settled over hacking battles. Yanma himself could be described as a bully with a hard exterior, but cares deeply for his people. During the ceremony, he refused to sign because of his distrust in Rakulis, and now he's trying to figure out how Gita was able to summon King Oger. Due to not wanting to join Rakulis, the Shugadam king wants to take over Inkosopa. However, Yanma would never bow to someone else, showing how strong of a leader he is to his people. Next we have Kamakiri Oger. Queen Himanoran of Ishibana, a kingdom of beauty and riches where it leads in medicine. Himano appears to be selfish on the outside, only wanting to have pure beauty in her area, as seen with her willing to blow up a home because it didn't match her standards. But she gives back to her people in the best possible way, showing that her selfishness is actually a front to hide her good intentions. After that is Hachi Oger. <laughs> Lord Kaguragi Debowski of Tofu, the place of harvest and where you'll find the best food in all of Chikyu. Kaguragi is a master manipulator, playing multiple sides to get what he wants, all in the name of Tofu, even if it means forming a secret partnership with Rakulis. Kaguragi's happy exterior is used to hide his constant lies. And finally, Papillon Oger. Papillon! Supreme Sovereign of Justice, Rita Kaniska of Gokan, a frozen prison where the law rules over all, and where you can catch the latest episodes of Mofun and Me. Rita's introduction is when we truly go deep into investigating Gira. Rita goes to each kingdom, including Sugodam, to find out what the royalty know about Gira, plus asking civilians their own experiences. You'd notice that Rita even made some appearances in the past few episodes. At the end of the trial, Rita explains that Gira is indeed royalty. 
Aside from being able to summon King Oger, Rita was able to find that Gita's DNA matches Rakulis's. Gita Hasti is pronounced innocent, much to Rakulis's dismay, taking his place as a royal. Gita returns to Shugodam and is greeted as royalty, now being referred to as Prince Gita. However, the Bugnarok are setting up their own plan, with cocoons around Chikyu that will form giant monsters and can't be destroyed. All they ask for in exchange of not destroying the planet is Gita. Yanma warns Gita of the Bugnarok dangers, but Gita goes to meet with Rakulis, who welcomes him with open arms. Rakulis explains Gita was kidnapped as a child, and if that ever got out, then it would have brought shame to the royal family, which is why his lineage was kept secret. With Gita understandably upset and chained up, the rest of the royals talk politics on how to stop the Bugnarok. Rita offers a peace treaty. Rakulis says no. He wants to fight. So Gita defies Rakulis in front of the townsfolk, claiming he'll take the kingdom for himself. To which Rakulis uses this opportunity to brand Gita as a real traitor. Meanwhile, Yanma and Himeno are butting heads over their mechas when we get Himeno's backstory. Fifteen years ago, the Ran royal family died due to an attack the people of Chikyu called the Fury of the Gods. Young Himeno helped people when she saw a figure inject her parents with, um, death. Yanma says he never met his parents, so the sadness of losing them was a privilege he doesn't have. Gita has been running off on his own, so Yanma says that as a king, they work together, especially in times of danger. Gita goes back to his allies and is told by Rita that Rakulis is asking for a trial by combat. Whoever loses this trial will be declared unfit to rule. Interestingly enough, Kaguragi was the one who suggested the trial by combat in the first place. Plus, Kaguragi being Kaguragi, offers Rakulis a special poison. The duel begins. Himeno explains this was basically a setup to hide Gita. Since they knew Rakulis was going to use the poison, they switched it with an anesthetic, if Kaguragi actually did switch it. One thing leads to another, and Gita is sliced off a cliff. The kings help Gita fake his death, when Gita is like, well now he'll let his guard down, so now's the perfect chance to kill him. Rita knocks him out. The kings agree to work together, then they call the retainers to secretly take Gita back. Meanwhile, the Bugnarok take this opportunity to invade the kingdoms, the kings nearly being wiped out. Gita wakes up being taken by Deathnarok. The royals aren't sure what their next move is when the cocoons are still around the kingdoms. Rakulis is playing politics, and Gita might be able to summon a new legendary mech, but has gone missing. For now, a couple of the kings are planning on evacuating their nations and leaving, but all the retainers say that it's not fair to try to fight alone. It's okay to ask for help, even if they are kings. The royals group up and declare themselves Osama Sentai King Oger, named after the Guardian Spirit. Together, they combine with the other mechas to form Legend King Oger, taking down the hatched bugs with ease. Rakulis takes all the credit, and Gita goes back into hiding. A mysterious figure in a white robe appears in front of Deathnarok, telling the story of King Oger. Kaguragi asks Rakulis for a funeral to mourn Gita. The kings have different ideas on how to go about this. <laughs> Common writer reference? The funeral begins, but Gita's coffin won't open. A white robed man comes forth to take it. He shows off some spider like powers, being able to climb walls and swing using webs. Gita is let out, and the figure asks if the Bugnarok are really humanity's enemy. After a mecha battle, Deathnarok steals the three other mechas. W wait, the white figure takes the guardian spirits himself. With them, he unmasks himself and creates a new weapon. He introduces himself as Jeremy Brasieri, a storyteller, and he one-shots Deathnarok. The opening to episode 12 reveals that Jeremy has been narrating everything to us. The kings confront him, and Jeremy says he's the one who wrote the story of King Oger and prophesies Bugnarok's invasion. Jeremy is in court and tries to play it cool with the storytelling theatrics, asking why a god's soul was in Rita's nation in the first place. It's because Jeremy put it there thousands of years ago. 
Jeremy has not been lying when he says he's over 2,000 years old and helped make the mechas work. However, Jeremy is also working with the Bugnarok. Kaguragi noticed that Deathnarok was not actually killed and escaped with Jeremy. The stranger admits he's been putting hints into who he is all day. They only need the subtext and to read between the lines. Gita starts to piece it all together. <laughs> Jeremy is the sixth king. Long ago, a king fell into forbidden love with the Bugnarok, running away together, erasing their history. They had a son and sealed his curse with a mask. Jeremy is now putting it upon himself to unite those in two different lines for those like him who are in between. The kings say he should have just started with that, cause they all have the same heart. Deathnarok does not agree with his ideals, so it's time for Jeremy to fight. An episode later, we get some of Yanma's backstory, how during the Fury of the Gods, a young Yanma was taught to start from the bottom, then keep rebuilding up. Following that, Himeno fights Jeremy, asking if he knows anything about poison killing her parents during the Fury of the Gods, but he's as cryptic as ever. Well, cryptic as saying as the truth is there between the lines, or something like that. Jeremy is put on trial, since Himeno accused him of being the cause of the Fury of the Gods over a decade ago. Turns out that Jeremy was actually asleep during that event. In order to apologize for Jeremy's... of uh, Jeremy-ness, Rita explains that the Mofun show was created in the first place to make Himeno happy after the Fury of the Gods. Later on, we learn that Kaguragi's sister is being kept a prisoner at Dracules' castle. His retainer tells the backstory. During the Fury of the Gods, Tofu went through a famine, so Kaguragi staged a rebellion against the lord who was hoarding food. As a deal with Rakules, Kaguragi's sister Suzume was offered as a bride, but she was more like a captive. Jeremy meets with Rakules, who says they'd like to work a peace offer with Bugnarok. In exchange, Jeremy wants Suzume to be freed. The kings try to save her, but it turns out Suzume is actually in love with Rakules and hates her brother for leaving her behind. Rakules secretly meets with Deathnarok. Now for Rita's backstory, we start with them watching Mofun and me, wanting a premium plushie. The premium plush is limited, but Rita has other important matters to discuss, such as observing their 15th anniversary of passing judgment. The person they passed judgment on was found guilty of murder, killing the previous sovereign of Gokan. Himeno helps Rita with some evidence, stating the poison used to kill the previous sovereign was the same type from a certain mech, and that the fury of the gods was caused by a person, not a natural disaster. But there's more. The sovereign faked their death in order to imprison the culprit, remaining impartial while also leaving a black mark of secrecy for the nation. Since Rita proved the fury of the gods was caused by a person, Himeno gives them a premium Mofun plush. After a secret negotiation with Deathnarok, Rakules explains that any nation who allies with him will be spared by the Bugnarok. Rakules laughs evilly. Yanma is nearly defeated in a battle with a new Bugnarok general, when Gita comes out of hiding and saves him. Gita and Rakules transform, with Rakules pulling out a power-up. Gita is nearly defeated again, but is saved by Jeremy. Rakules says the power of the Founder's Crown was passed down by the family of Shugodam, and anyone who wears it is recognized as a true king. The kings are in agreement that Gita must defeat Rakules by any means necessary. Meanwhile, Jeremy is sad because <laughs> he thinks he's been ruining everything. Lamau. Rakules summons King Ojer Zero, but Kaguragi has other plans. He says he's been searching for a way to use this new mech from the start, passing hints to Suzume and vice versa. With that, Kaguragi takes the founder's crown for Gita, transforming him into King Kuwagata Ojer. And summoning Extreme King Ojer. Gita asks Rakules what happened to his old dream, people being kings of their own countries. Why does Rakules want it all for himself? Rakules, wounded and under duress by the Bugnarok, announces his allyship with them, roles reversed as Rakules is treated like dirt and is told to kill his own guard. 
He barely escapes and gets his just desserts by asking Yama, the person he had nearly killed, for help. The kings group up after saving Shukadam's people, announcing they will unite as a new organization taking the name of their god, Osama Sentai, King Oger. They transform together. After some cool fighting, Hercules is almost cleared of everything he's done, despite him saying it was all for justice. If only Yanma and Jeremy hadn't made him fall into a fart joke. So Gita declares a trial by combat for the throne. Suzume and Rakulis get married, a political move so Kagaragi would be forced to ally with him. Anyway, the duel begins. Gita gets the upper hand, then says if Rakulis admits to all his wrongdoings and injustices, Gita will surrender. As before, Gita remembered a just king, a kind king, in Rakulis. However, he is not that now. The Bugnarok interrupt their duel, but their brothers continue to fight. Rakulis admits to seeing people only as tools for him to rule the nation, a just king in his own terrible way. With a final slash, Gita wins the duel and is soon to be crowned the new king of Shugodam. Following episode 20, we have the summer movie Adventure Heaven. Oh wow, this is actually a 40 minute Sentai movie. Oh no wait, I'm just showing the TTFC version. Anyway, Gita begins his coronation when it's interrupted by a mysterious person welcoming the kings to visit the land of the dead. Gita recognizes the singer, a woman named Devonica, who used to be at their orphanage. Toei's ambition continues to shine as the land of the dead actually looks really good and beautiful here. The kings are introduced to someone, the founding king from 2000 years ago, Rainiol Hasti, who wants Gita to give up the throne for him, or else a catastrophe will occur. To do that, Devonica must sacrifice herself, but of course, Gita won't allow that. Meanwhile, the other kings are facing their own past. Himeno meets with her parents, Kagoragi meeting the previous lord who hoarded food, Rita facing the ghosts of the people they judged, and Yanma trying to find a way back home. Two comedic results. Although, the king's retainers go to them for support. Himeno gets to say goodbye. Kagoragi understands he's a benevolent ruler. Rita hears the thanks of the dead. And Yanma <laughs> is Yanma. Gita faces Rainiol. The kings fight together, and after the battle, Rainiol tells Gita that Rakulis is alive, which is why he isn't in the land of the dead, so Gita should return once his battle is done, so he can be told the true story of Chikyu. In the after credits, Rainiol faces off against a new threat, but is killed with ease. With that, Gita is officially crowned king of Shugodam. Skipping to episode 24, Death Narok has resorted to an extreme plan, blowing up the planet. So Bugnarok burrows into the core, causing a heat wave to hit the topsoil. Jeremy fights Deathnarok, who explains that history is what states that Bugnarok are the bad guys. History says King Oger defeated the Bugnarok, with no other written legacy, explaining how or why. Allegedly, the Bugnarok wanted to exterminate humanity, but Jeremy was the one who wrote the story, and doesn't know why. After a mecha fight, Deathnarok appears on the surface and fights the kings, leaving Jeremy confused on where his loyalty is. Jeremy reveals his full name, Jeremy Aidomonarok ne Brasieri. Their connection is distant, but they share the Narok name. Desnarok doesn't care and will stop at nothing to destroy the planet. He jumps into Chikyu's core. The current mechs won't be able to withstand the planet's core, let alone Desnarok himself. Yanma believes they have a chance if they combine all the Shu gods and castle together, but they'll need 20 pilots, and not just anyone will do. Before anyone else, Jeremy faces a Bugnarok, Gerojin. This Bugnarok has been serving as a spy both underground and on the surface, often helping him basically since Jeremy showed up. Gerojin starts to berate him, saying that Jeremy's biggest flaw is that he does things half-heartedly, especially when it comes to unifying two sides that clearly don't want anything to do with each other. So Jeremy gathers his resolve, deciding that he's not a king of the in-between. He wants to be king of the Bugnarok, and wants Gerojin to be his retainer. The rest of the kings gather their servants and retainers, but more than that, they gather their friends to fight by their side. Twenty pilots take their seat to form God King Oger. They bring Deathnarok to the surface and fight together. The kings take their battle to the ground level, when Jeremy declares a duel with Deathnarok for the throne. Before their duel, Jeremy asks the kings for the biggest favor. If Jeremy were to be crowned king, he would want the Bugnarok to be recognized as his own nation. 
Jeremy also reveals that Bugnarok had been eating the shoe gods that were around during the Fury of the Gods, with a price. If Bugnarok grows giant, then it will die. Deathnarok has been trying to protect his kind, at the cost of his own life slowly decaying. Rita recognizes the nation, and citizens that Jeremy is fighting for. All that's left is for him to be king. The duel begins, and Jeremy gets the upper hand quickly, due to Deathnarok already being in a weakened state. Gita offers an apology. They've been fighting for so long that they lost sight of what's right and wrong. Deep down, Deathnarok did want to live peacefully, but humans didn't want to listen and were forced to fight. Deathnarok is pinned down by his retainer, Kamijin, who was pulling the strings the entire time. Kamijin wanted the death in war. It's just how life works. Flowers bloom at the end of destruction, and he doesn't want that. Deathnarok says his final words. <laughs> Jeremy is officially recognized and is crowned king of the Bugnarok. He understands not everyone will accept this, but he gives his word that humans and Bugnarok have reconciled. One day, maybe not tomorrow, or even the next day, but one day, the two will join hands in harmony. The war between Bugnarok and humans has ended, but something worse looms on the horizon. All of that was Osama Sentai King Oger Chapter 1. If any of this interested you, then I highly recommend stopping here and actually watching Chapter 2 on your own. If not, then let's continue. On the planet of Chikyu, five kings ended the war between humans and Bugnarok, recognizing a new nation under Jeremy Brasieri. Two years later, Jeremy has nearly fallen. Kamijin says a new threat has come. The kings are gone, and the retainers have taken their place. They're not very good at it. The retainers group up in time to witness a rumbling, resembling the fury of the gods. A new threat shows itself. Uchu King Dagde du Jardin. Uchu being a combination of the words universe and bugs in Japanese. He shows his power by teleporting Gita to the planets he's destroyed and left barren. Dagdead reveals he's been trying to get the Bugnarok and humans of Chikyu to wipe each other out, so King Dagdead is here to clean up the planet himself, along with his five jesters. However, Gita refuses to bow down, because now is a perfect time to call for the return of Osama Sentai King Ojer. The return was brought upon by Gedojin, who begs for the king's help, while they were imprisoned. One of Dagdad's jester's powers is to persuade others, such as having people start to turn on each other. The king's retainers strike them down due to this power, so the kings advise a plan. The public will think the kings have retaliated, so the retainers were forced to fight back. When the kings are about to tell the public what happened, Jeremy arrives to stop them, saying he was behind the attack, making the public think the Bugnarok are still their enemy, sacrificing his goodwill for the kings to maintain peace with themselves. Jeremy and Gerojin exile themselves. Gita finds Jeremy when a figure in a black cloak is found freezing to death. Himeno's kingdom starts to freeze over as well, as Karas, the previous sovereign, appears. Long ago, Karas bestowed the power of ice to Rita, which is why they hide their gray eyes. Rita believes Karas used this power to imprison themselves and the person behind the fury of the gods. Gita and Jeremy bring the hooded figure to Himeno, when she realizes that she knows who this person is, Grody, one of the five jesters, and the reason behind the fury of the gods. Rita attempts to sacrifice themselves, the same way Karas did by using the power of ice, but Himeno stops them. And then, another Bugnarok appears, Jeremy's mom. It was Dagdad's plan to bring Jeremy's mom back for... Uh, I have no idea. Jeremy explains she brought down the Bugnarok's strongest general while trying to protect the young Jeremy. Now he doesn't want to help fight her. Yanma rightfully calls him a mama's boy. King Dagdad feels like his plan has worked out perfectly, since the kings are acting like fools and have no idea what to do. But that was just them turning the plan around. Jeremy says his mom felt warm, but she died a long time ago. So the kings decided to play along with Dagdad's expectations. 
They defeat Jeremy's giant mom. Duck Dead decides enough is enough and just throws them into a portal, having them land on Earth. The king sees civilians hypnotized by something, and old monsters start attacking. Luckily, these people have help from other heroes. A man named Prince is here to fight off the monsters, and says he's going to become king of the world. Dead Boss has returned with their new leader, so that means an old team returns as well. A few of our kings stumble upon ancient slabs being looked over by a man named Ian, who I completely forgot was an archaeologist in Kyriujer. <laughs> this returning team, the Kyriujers, say they fought Debos 10 years ago. But two years ago, Doug Dead attacked Japan, getting rid of the team's bravery and the people's spirit. Two of the other Kyriujers left the planet to investigate the villains. Prince was sent from the future to help the current Kyriujers. Yanma creates a new caliber for Prince, one that combines a Kyriujer sword with the king's own technology. Feeling Gita's spirit, Prince is able to feel bravery once again, and transforms. Lots of civilian fights for the King Ojas later, and a Deboss general is defeated, but somehow, Deboss has returned. Ian reveals more of the relic, and Jeremy has a revelation. Jeremy's own father and his people migrated to the planet the Kyriujers are from. The King see people fall into despair, so Gita and Rita try to cheer them up, because sorrow is exactly what the enemy would want them to feel. The kings share moments with the Kyriujers, such as Nosan and Kaguragi talking about their sisters. Jeremy recounts a story to the kings about how 2,000 years ago, Jeremy's father and other humans traveled to another planet using the Shugodam castle. They decided to name the planet Chikyu after their home of Earth. Ami, Kyuryu Pink, finds the Kyriujer mechas. Prince almost calls Ami his mom, with a voice cameo from King himself telling him to take care of Gabatira. If you haven't watched Kiryujer, I know that's a lot of name drops, but this is mostly for the Kiryujer fans, and if you didn't know Kiryujer in the first place, then uh, it's not too important from here on out. Suzume receives a message to launch the Shugadam castle into space, along with the king's mechs. And more importantly, for uh, fans of Kiryujer, and especially me, who really wanted to see confirmation of Nosan and Candelera's relationship, uh, here, they also exposit that they're going to get married, and that is super adorable. I've been waiting to hear confirmation of that for like 10 hecking years. I'm so happy to hear it. The Kiryujers needed the Earth's melody to transform, so Himeno thinks back and plays a Kiryujer theme. They all transform, regaining their bravery. Debos grows giant, and the team fights together in their mechs. The kings fly back home to Chikyu, but they're greeted by getting rocks thrown at them. The people think of Doug Dead as their king, since Gita and the rest were gone for six months. Gita is told of a new ruler taking over while the kings were gone, a man named Shugo Kamen, who gave the people of Shugodam treasures from other kingdoms, such as video games and food. By the way, many Tira follow Gita home, in case you wanted to buy more brand new toys. The kings go back to Shugodam Castle, where Suzume calls for Shugo Kamen, the man who allowed Dog Dead and his jesters to take over the kingdoms. Shugo Kamen unmasks himself, Raculis Hasti, who will unite all the kingdoms under one rule. Once the kings left, Dog Dead's jesters took control of each nation, with Unkosopa being mind-controlled. We get a flashback of when Yanma was a scavenger, making new, hidden technology that was about to be taken by some thugs that were led by their soon-to-be retainer. With his old bootleg tech, Yanma stops the brainwashing and fights the jester. However, Yanma throws away his technology to keep his retainer safe, saying they'll start from zero, just like before. It's Kakuragi's turn to take back his country, as Grody revived the previous lord of Tofu, a woman named Iroki, who he'd last saw in the Land of the Dead. In Kaguragi's flashback, we saw he was a rice farmer that was invited to stay in the castle because of how good his rice was and because he was a true, honest man. However, once the fury of the gods happened, Iroki hoarded the food, so Kaguragi went to deal with her, coming back with bloodied hands. Iroki's last request was for Kaguragi to kill her, but he didn't, so she called him a traitor. Iroki reveals that she didn't hoard the rice for malicious intentions. All of the rice was poisoned by Grody. With Kaguragi's refusal to slay her, he was called a traitor to take the throne, despite Iroki's righteousness for her people. Grody is defeated, and Iroki returns to the land of the dead. Yama reveals they may have a way to fight back against the Uchu, 
by the power of their older calibers. They don't have much time left either, since Dagdad is starting to get bored and wants to destroy Chikyu already. The kings attempt to storm Inkosopa's castle to upload an ultra computer and unlock their powers, the same computer that put Yanma in prison. However, Yanma already planned to fail, and his retainer unleashes the Shu God's hidden abilities, the Fangs of Defiance. This power-up is basically just extra CGI. It's a little disappointing, but hey, it's a neat idea. <laughs> the Jester undoes her brainwashing on Inkosopa and is defeated, although she switches places with another Jester at the last second. Raculis is summoned by Dugdead, who knew that Raculis had a hand in Gorma's death, since Raculis let the Jester know of her eventual downfall. She brainwashed Gorma to sacrifice himself. Dugdead sees this as a fun game, and allows Raculis to become one of his new Jesters. Episode 40 shows us another crossover with Prince. It's only for the beginning, as Shugo Kamen makes a big announcement. First, he reveals he's Raculis, and says he sided with the Uchu to stop Gita, who is actually a creation of Dugdead. That's how Gita was able to control the Shu gods, with his galactic power. With that revelation, Gita and Raculis fight back. When Kaguragi helps Raculis power up with the Founder's Crown, leaving Gita defeated. Since Gita is a creation of Dugdead, Raculis is given the power to kill an immortal being. However, Raculis turns the sword on Dugdead. 17 years ago during the Fury of the Gods, Dugdead laughed in Raculis' face, knowing he will do nothing to stop the Uchu. On that day, Raculis made a plan to fight back. At first, Raculis planned to take the kingdoms and take down the Bugnarok to gain Dugdead's trust. However, he truly didn't account for Gita's return, though Raculis took Gita as an advantage. Gita followed Raculis' plans at every step, but that just changed course for new plans. Marrying Suzume was another step. That way, Kaguragi could play both sides. Raculis made himself to be a tyrant king for the people to look up to Gita. Together, the brothers defeat Dugdead. Raculis is then put on trial to tell a story. When Raculis was young, his father, Kassas, told him about the Uchu that they swore loyalty to. When Gita was born through Dugdead's powers, Kassas planned to use him purely as a tool and not a person. Raculis did not want that and ran off with Gita when the fury of the gods happened. Dugdead has returned through one of his jesters, so Raculis is set up to help the team and fight once again. Grody calls forth a new fury of the gods, then Dugdead reveals that Bugnarok came from another planet, pitting them against humans on Terra to fight for a place to live. With that, the kings do what they can to evacuate all their citizens underground to Jeremy's kingdom. Grody is defeated and enters the land of the dead, ending the fury of the gods. The final confrontations are about to begin. Gita wakes up on a destroyed battlefield, preparing for a battle against Dugdead. Rewinding before that, Yanma manages to think of a new mecha that will combine all of their powers, including the powers of their symbols, to fight back, even if Dugdead uses his galactic threats. These new powers will be their light that pierces the universe. Speaking of which, Dugdead shows up in the throne room, and the kings immediately transform to fight. With the flick of his wrist, Dugdead starts to destroy the nations, there's little time for Yanma to build a mecha, so the kings begin evacuation plan zero. The retainers have special bags made for them, and civilians are ready to board the Shugadam ship, but the retainers feel like something is off. Opening their bags, they see the symbols of the kings left for them. Jeremy prepared a message for them. Their last resort was to have everyone evacuate the planet, as the kings sacrifice themselves to stay back and fight Dugdead. The retainers want to fight alongside them, not wanting to make this a cycle for thousands of years. Raculis led the people to charge, but Kamijim appears to stop them. Although, someone else returns as well. Then suddenly, meteors hit the planet, taking us to where we began. The Shugodam ship fails to make it off Chikyu, and the rest of the kings are barely holding on, until the retainers step foot in the ruins. People in Bugnarok from all across Chikyu stand behind the kings to fight in the war on the Uchu. The battle is on, but not everyone is an experienced fighter, so Devonica returns with more help. After a few moments of respite, the kings stand and are ready to conquer the world. Episode 50, We Will Rule the World. The final battle truly begins, as Jeremy, Raculis, and Deathrock 
face off against Kamijim, while the rest of the kings fight Dug Dead. He grows giant, so it's time to summon the ultimate power, a light that can pierce the universe. With a punch that breaks through the galaxy, and a final strike, Dug Dead Dujardin is defeated. Jeremy, Rita, Kaguragi, Yanma, Himeno, and Gira return home. When my other Tokutuber friends and I recorded a discussion for this channel about King Ojer, I said that the show feels like the first truly different Sentai in a long time. It's a similar feeling I have with the difference between Showa and Heisei Tokusatsu. Reiwa Rider in his first few years still feel like it's Heisei, while Sentai has been needing a shakeup for a while in terms of ratings, as its financials have been more or less consistent. Luckily, Reiwa Sentai has been very good and its ratings reflect that, starting from Kira Major's old is new approach, Zenkaiger becoming a serialized comedy, with some visual differences, to Hun Brothers being just an insane show overall, to now with King Oger's ambition. That's the key word. Ambition. Watching King Oger, you'd probably notice the abundant use of green screen. It's that obvious. For better and for worse. Well, it's both green screen and sonic technology using extreme wide LED monitors. The most famous example of its use is with the Mandalorian. You've probably also seen them for advertisements and in sports stadiums, but its use for television and movies is only becoming more commonplace with sci-fi and such. While a bit tougher to plan out production-wise, it allows for higher quality backgrounds and gives something for actors to truly blend in with, especially with these screens that are basically their own light source. While still being technology to learn with, King Oger is taking that extra step to incorporate them into an entire television production. A lot of shots look phenomenal. They're gorgeous. Then we get other shots blending green screen floors and the illusion kind of fades away. Personally, some shots of Shugadam's throne room look really off to me, though I think that's purely because of the CG itself and not the screens. It did also take me at least half the show to be able to completely ignore the inconsistencies. Still, the truly admirable thing about all this is the ambition to try it all, and the scope. Chikyu truly feels like a whole other planet, at least when scenes aren't shot in the usual toy quarry or familiar stadiums we've seen before. Beyond that, there's ambition to tell a planet-wide story. The political intrigue of chapter 1 captures a lot of what I enjoy in dramas, tension between our characters not fully trusting each other, but understand that they have to fight together, eventually growing closer. Still a bit hesitant, but closer. The kings have their regular disagreements, whether it's because it's a clash of ideals or because they're thinking of their own nations. It's the little interactions and bits of acting that really sell the idea that these people have kingdoms to think about, all while taking on a threat that's been at their people's sides for thousands of years. Speaking of which, I unfortunately don't have too much to say about the Bugnarok or the toys for that matter. One thing I really don't like in shows is when villains are defeated and they go, Oh wait, I'm actually a good guy and only wanted to have my species live. Kamen Rider Drive is the only pass for that kind of story and only because I was a basic idea since the start. Um, Death Narok and the other Uchu have neat designs though. The Uchu, when mentioning their designs, I love the whole bug motif but with the space theme with it, especially Dug Dead. I'm just a huge sucker for suits that have elements of parts within other see-through parts, like with Dug Dead's head. Though the other thing I don't like about villains is when we have a guy who can literally blow up the whole planet with ease and just doesn't do it because he doesn't feel like it. Dug Dead says he doesn't do that because he's bored, which is kind of respectable, I guess, but, you know. And I guess super real quickly, again, I don't have too much to say about the toys. Uh, the sword is cool. I, I don't like that the actual toy itself is small, but, you know, it's for kids. Uh, the jingles are kind of nice. I'm not a fan of, like, the You Are the King part of the jingle, though. Um, it, it looks fun to play with. I, I And again, that's really all I can say. It, even King Oger itself as a mecha, it looks, it looks cool, but again, that's all I can say. Anyway, despite my praises for the stories, I really only have surface level enjoyment with the main cast. That is, I do really like the characters, Yanma especially, though they do their jobs well, and that's pretty much it. I'm sure there's going to be one Toku Boomer who says that the Sentai Reds these days are way too loud, but I don't think Gita was that bad either, especially in the second half. 
Uh, Jeremy absolutely is a huge standout. I love his story. I love his personality. I love his suit. I love his his civilian clothing too. I think Jeremy is easily like in my top five favorite uh, six rangers at this point. But back to the characters, if anything, I much prefer the retainers being on screen, basically as a separate found family. I know I didn't mention the retainers much, especially by name, but they're all great. Their backstories are wonderful. Sebastian, he knows Butler, probably has one of my favorite episodes in the entire show, post time skip and all. On that subject, it absolutely blew my mind just hearing that there was a time skip. There's been some time skips before in Toku, Agito and Die Ranger come to mind first, but those were at the very end, while King Oger has her time skip halfway through the show. Again, it's the ambition to do something big that Sentai actually hasn't done in this way before. But much like the LED and green screens, the idea is admirable, just not fully there yet. During our discussion and on his own videos, Thomas Jujubee brought up how the time skip didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. It allowed for Gita to be king while the others were imprisoned, with little to no change in the status quo. The only time I remember anything of that time being brought up is when Yama used his ultra computer to activate the Vangs of Defiance. Otherwise, it felt like you could have said the time skip was a week later and it really wouldn't have changed anything. Well, all except for one thing. Episode 29 has one of my favorite moments in all of Tokusatsu when Jeremy gives up everything he built in the past two years, all to protect his friends and keep their nations united. It's a great heroic sacrifice that could have only been as powerful with the passing of time. Of course, they go back to the status quo quickly after that, but, you know, the idea is there. That actually sums up my thoughts perfectly about the show. Yeah, there are great ideas outside of ambition, but even sticking with the core Super Sentai themes the show doesn't stick with long-term consequences often. Which makes things feel weird when the consequences that do stick around are actually really interesting. Rita's eye, everything that has to do with Grody, Jeremy basically living with the thought of being the last of his kind, all fantastic ideas that are explored as much as they need to be. What stuck with me the most was the serialization. The story just keeps going at a steady pace with new elements introduced gradually until we get a full-on war in the last couple of episodes. I loved each episode since they all felt like they progressed the fight against the enemy without dragging on. Although the lowest points for me have to be the body swap and the one where they all turn to kids. I, I, I think those are just straight up weird. It was kind of funny that Kagodagi said he looked that way since he was 10. But still, I, I'm not. I'm just not a fan of body swap episodes in the first place. So yeah, they, these are low points, but they're like the only low points for me. And I did want to mention real quick. Okay, so you know this clip slash gif of Rakules burying his head in his hands. I wasn't keeping up with King Oger week to week, so when I saw this clip, I thought it was supposed to be a really serious crazy moment Rakules just finally like like lost everything and he's about to like like like, like just go to his deepest lowest point and i find out while watching that he does that over a fart joke and i just like blew up in my in my friend group chat about this like oh my gosh i can't believe that this really cool gif came from a fart joke <laughs> okay final thoughts overall Osama Senta King Oger is a very good show with a fantastic story and characters I'm sure you'll fall in love with more than I did. I was here for ambition, but I stayed to see where those ideas took me. Normally, I'd go deeper to talk about actor interviews, production, and such, but I wanted to see how this new-ish format would do if I actually just did have a recap with my thoughts and nothing else. And it was a lot easier to make, so maybe I can do this for other Sentai videos going forward. Let me know in the comments below if you just enjoyed listening to the story in the first half and then my thoughts in the second half. With all that being said, join me next time when we take a handle on life with Bakugage Sentai Boom Boonger. I should have had Keza do her, uh, her, her voice at the end there. Uh, oh well. <laughs>